Yes, I, the title of this talk, uh, I think, raises the question what a public intellectual is, because it's a slightly vague uh, term. Um, I suppose one can think of two kinds of uh, public intellectuals. One goes back to Zola, uh, is the, the, man, the, the en engagé, the person who gets involved in political campaigns, um, who signs petitions, uh, who's always got a cause to defend, uh, and so on. Um, and I suppose uh, an obvious name that comes to mind uh, in this kind of intellectual would be somebody like um, Susan Sontag, perhaps. Um, she did that as well as many other things. Then there's the other kind, um, the public pundit, uh, the academic term journalist, um, the person who has a, a, an important role, perhaps, in um, essentially telling businessmen and others who are too busy to read books uh, what to think uh, uh, reasonably about any given topic. Um, people who uh, write columns, um, who uh, shine at um, international forums, uh, attended by politicians and CEOs, and so on, uh, popularizes, but often in the best sense, uh, not always, uh, and I suppose something like Neil Ferguson when it comes to mind. Um, Isaiah Berlin, I think, fits neither category, or fitted neither category, uh, and in that sense he perhaps was not a public intellectual. Um, some people in the last few days have suggested that there was an element, perhaps a lack of courage, uh, involved in, in his reluctance to stick his neck out. Possibly, uh, but I think there may be a more um, positive spin on this, in that he, in everything he said and wrote, I think there was a deep skepticism uh, about politicizing ideas or lending ideas to, to political causes. I think he saw the danger of, um, of intellectuals um, getting too close to power, getting too close to people who, who, who exercise power. And, um, and this skepticism is all to the good. I think he, and he operated in, in societies, uh, the United Kingdom and the United States, where there is uh, this skepticism towards ideas and intellectuals is widely shared. Uh, these are relatively Philistine societies in that sense. There is a deep skepticism about intellectual life. Um, and you could argue that that creates a kind of firewall um, that stops intellectual ideas from becoming dangerous and being taken to their to extremes. Now, it would be a bit odd uh, for a deeply cultivated uh, uh, man, an intellectual, to uh, dedicate his life uh, to preserving a, a strong element of, of, of philistinism in his society. And I think Isaiah Berlin did quite the opposite, in fact. And where he was a public figure is um, in such institutions as the BBC's third programme, as an educator um, in making society less philistine and teaching people not what to think, which is um, one kind of public intellectual that I mentioned, but in a, in a way to, to teaching people how to think. And that involved uh, a large degree of skepticism. And I think he also did it through humor, which is why humor was not just something he used because he was a humorous man, it was something to lighten up, uh, something that would otherwise have become boring for a large audience. I think humor was an essential element in his thinking. That is to say, the humour uh, well, uh, injected uh, exactly the right degree of, of, of questioning and scepticism uh, that is necessary to avoid ideas from taking off uh, and, and, uh, and, and going off to extremes. Now, the question that I think we should perhaps discuss is to what extent that is sufficient, that an, uh, an intellectual should confine him or herself to being an educator. Uh, or whether perhaps more is needed. And so the distance that an intellectual should take in his public life or her public life from politics, from people who are in the business of politics. Um, is it a good thing in America, for example, that um, intellectuals become public servants every time there's a new administration? Or is, to what extent is that a corrupting influence, both on their ideas and, and, uh, or not? Is the, to what extent is, is, is philistinism or a degree of philistinism a good thing or not? And perhaps we can talk about this in the course of our discussion. Well, thank you. I, I, I mean, I think that the, I agree with you that the, um, the phrase public intellectual is a very unsatisfactory one. Um, and there's a basic tension for anyone who um, risks being disused. <coughs> 
described with this phrase, um, the tension between the, the, if you are too intellectual, the public um, may not be interested in you, and if you are too public, you're a fellow intellectual, if there are such things, and they think you are no longer one of them. Um, and you see that in the way in which people practice this trade, as you say, of punditry or education. Uh, I think what's striking about Isaiah Berlin um, the question, uh, uh, why on earth did anyone listen to him? Um, uh, this is a man who wrote essentially no books, um, uh, wrote essentially discourse through essays, um, stood for no strong political position, wasn't identified with any political party, um, and yet he had a tremendous authority uh, and influence um, and resonance. Um, what's the example of that to our current public Some of his authority um, came from his worldly experience, um, the, the fact that he had been um, uh, in, in Moscow um, uh, working with the British Embassy, that he had been in Washington, that he had the heritage that he did um, uh, in uh, Latvia uh, and, and, and uh, Russia. Um, partly it came from his um, reluctance to definite, I think, is he seems to have achieved a wonderful certainty about his uncertainty. And I think that that's an example that we can, we can follow. Um, but perhaps just to emphasize the first one at the moment, where does the authority of um, Susan Sontag and Neil Ferguson, uh, a Nicholas Stern, a um, Dominique Moisey, or a Joseph Joffe, and Ian Baruma, or a Bill Emmer, where does it come from? certain that there is climate change and something needs to be done about it. Science can never be certain. The data is inherently doubtful. And yet on the other side, um, people use that uncertainty of the data um, in order to be certain that nothing should be done um, and that we should be, we should um, simply wait and see on climate change. Scientists and people who Lecturers, particularly economists, who question some of the conclusions of the intergovernmental panel on climate change are demonized, um, even in relatively respectable publications like Scientific America. They've been demonized. Um, the Danish statistician, um, his name is just escaping me, um, the skeptical environmentalist, Bjorn Lomborg, Bjorn Lomborg, Bjorn Lomborg has been demonized um, in many uh, quarters for questioning.
even if it's a proposition that people should disagree with. Uh, certainly at the between and, a, and a, an important balance to be struck between offering the definite opinion of the publication, um, the, the writing of the publication on the one hand, and offering the facts and uh, the analysis, the information through which readers could come up with their own opinion, and acknowledging doubt and humility um, in, in uh, seeking that, and indeed in the very principle principles are like Berlinian principles of uncertainty, humility, of the lack of clear solutions, of the lack of, of, of utopian solutions. And yet, every week we, it runs five editorials saying, here are the five things that you need to do um, in the world. Um, as on its cover, Berlusconi is definitely not fit to govern uh, Italy. So are we all hypocrites? Possibly. <laughs> Yes, well, the economist, <laughs> the economist obviously has played a very important role in teaching busy people what to think in any given time. But um, I was just thinking of what gives people the what, what gives people the authority, um, why why are people listen to. I can think of perhaps two reasons uh, why certain people are listened to. Uh, one is the is the court jester, the other is the outsider, and I think. Well, possibly because um, Anglo-Saxon societies have this rather Philistine firewall, um, it's often the sort of the foreign wizard, the foreign wise man, um, who has a certain natural authority. Henry Kissinger, with his German accent, comes to mind. Uh, and I think possibly outside Berlin, um, somewhat benefited from the same thing. I mean, he was, in some ways, the exotic wise man, uh, incarnate probably to many people. Saxon societies. And the other thing is that the other uh, figure that's become much more prominent in recent years, um, precisely because experts and talking heads uh, on television are beginning to bore people and are too often uh, party B, uh, they're speaking f for a certain line. Um, you see this in the United States where somebody like John Stewart, uh, a comic figure, um, in the Bush, Bush years, began to get, have more authority as um, uh, a public figure. I, I wouldn't call him a public intellectual, but he, he was certainly as a commentator. He had more authority than, um, well, uh, Neil Ferguson. Um, uh, probably rightly so. <laughs> um, but it, 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 I, I'm not sure this is an entirely good thing, but the, the fact that the court jester who can say things, because he is sort of others uh, would hesitate to say, um, I take it more seriously. Perhaps there is a deeply traditional uh, reason for this, and court justice has always been around. Maybe um, this is one of the models that the public intellectual should take seriously. Well, I see it's certainly a way to um, speak truth to power, isn't it, um, uh, to be the court jester. Um, on the other model, I mean, I think your question about whether um, uh, thinkers others um, should go into government um, uh, as they do so often in America but also in other countries is a very good one. Um, I think that a lot of the authority of, of um, sort of uh, intellectual figures does come from their independence, um, from being outsiders to some degree. Um, you can't be an outsider by being an exotic um, foreigner in whichever country you're in. You're an outsider by being beholden to no one. who skates a very fine line in that is um, Paul Krugman, actually. Um, ironically, someone who's never taken a public position. He's probably angry that he hasn't been offered one, <laughs> in fact. Um, but he is clearly in his um, columns in the New York Times, very politically partisan. Uh, and I think that that damages him a, a bit, but it probably adds to his entertainment value and builds his following. Um, because, of course, another tension 
course, is very much part of that. I mean, to, to go back to the court jester, I mean, more and more, in order to get an audience, in order to sell your books, in order to have your, to be read, um, one has to be an entertainer, uh, including uh, sitting on public stages far, far more often than good for one. Um, and uh, I, we don't need to mention more names, but certain people come to mind who are, are very intelligent. But I think we have to become corrupted by being splendid entertainers and getting sort of carried away yeah. uh, in their desire uh, to outrage. But I think that the freelance... It's a little bore everyone from now on. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, I think the freelance in some ways may be less um, prone to corruption than, 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 than the people who um, are more beholden to, for their livelihood to, to institutions because um, it's a bit like people who say newspapers um, can't be trusted because they're in the business of making money. But it's better to be in the business of making money than being in the business any other business, really. I mean, if you're going to be um, uh, in the business of public information at all. And so, uh, with all the dangers of, um, of, 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 of Schmokarai, uh, I, I think it's okay to be, um, probably, to, 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 to have to make a living. Oh, I think so, as long as it's reasonably transparent. should we be um, illuminated? What, what does society think of it? Think of it? And, and, and that then comes back also to the question of authority. I mean, in, the, in the media, there's now a great um, argument about um, well, should the New York Times be, become, uh, become a, a, a non-profit organization, which of course it already is, it's losing money, <laughs> um, but um, should it become a, a, a charity and uh, be, be protected because it's such a wonderful um, creation building um, um, against the, the, uh, the menace of the blogosphere and of the democratization of the internet. I think this is a terrible way of thinking. Um, I think that uh, the great development of the internet and widespread education is that actually, although societies are in the end, have a certain philistine character, actually the ability to communicate, to analyze, to discuss has become much more widespread. listen to you has become easier as well, um, but that in this uh, much more broad sphere in which we can all Twitter um, uh, and uh, blog and so forth, there is a question of how do you get people to believe you? How do you get people to think that what you're saying is independent? How do you get people to distinguish what you're saying from what everyone else is saying? And I think there the qualities of the of, uh, of Berlin Experience, but also his obvious uh, <coughs> of, um, of, of the way in which um, he built his credibility, if you like, by, by the, the, the clarity of what he said, by the, um, by the um, sense of, 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 of uncertainty, but also great intelligence in, in analysis, um, is a lesson to all of us, just being shrill and just telling jokes in the dark. But he was very much, I mean, he had many loyalties, but I think he was very much a man who, who was loyal to institutions, who believed in institutions, yeah. and, and not for nothing, because, um, as you say, uh, for, somebody to, for somebody's voice to carry a certain authority, it needs an imprimatur of an institution, whether it's The Economist, whose articles are always, of course, to be absolutely trusted uh, as, a, as a great institution, or Oxford University, or The New York Times. Now, the problem uh, in the press, as you, you know better than I do, is that it's, it, it's going to be increasingly difficult to make these institutions pay for themselves. Um, but we do need them, because I think people just are going on the blogosphere, I mean, some of them are more interesting than others, but there is no filter, there is no institution that can give it a certain responsibility. Uh, Academia is in a somewhat better place, but um, uh, there are many examples um, that show us that being part of a, even a reputable is no guarantee for reputable opinions, but at least it's, it's, it gives a certain um, context to what somebody is saying. And in, in, in 
terms of public life, uh, newspapers, uh, television, even television. And uh, I'd be interested in your views and how economically this can remain a viable way of filtering or, or, or um, separating the rubbish from the somewhat, somewhat reputable. I, I think it's going to have to happen through the building of, of new types of institutions, really, which, by which is simply meant new um, uh, groupings, associations, labels that, uh, that um, people come to trust uh, and come to, come to consider to be credible. Um, because if, if that doesn't happen, they won't, they won't, you can't get the economic work. People won't be paying, paying a subscription um, or the audience won't be sufficiently well identified for advertisers to, to pay um, adequately to finance them and therefore the quality will not be there. And I think that there's going to be a great effort over the next uh, few years to try to like, build online institutions, the equivalents of the New York Times, the, uh, the Economist, the uh, Der Spiegel, um, and, and so on, um, to, to get that association. Now, I think that there is a great instinct in life, commercial and uh, otherwise, to trust, to find institutions you trust. Um, back these days for obvious reasons to um, editorials I wrote in the 1980s when finance was changing a lot um, about how finance was always going to be a cottage industry because um, you know ultimately um, if you didn't like how much you were being paid at, um, at your company you could set off, go off and set up your own. This was one of the most wrong editorials I ever wrote um, because it all became concentrated in the hands of Goldman Sachs, Morgan Stanley, Lehman Brothers um, uh, and Merrill Lynch. Now, look where that led us, but nevertheless, um, I think that tendency in, in finance to, to have institutions, franchises, they, got, they came to call it, a strange word, um, in the financial industry, um, tells us something about the media as well and, and the trust in ideas that you need some sort of association. You've heard of these marvelous online institutions called the browser. Yes, it's a great book. Absolutely, that's right. I, I trust it completely. Um, I'm beginning to feel a bit self-conscious, sort of having a, a conversation in front of an audience. And that, that's we need a bit more. Absolutely. Well, I mean, uh, Isaiah Berlin was reputed to be one of the great conversationalists. So, Sarah, thank you for letting us into this into this conversation, which I'm sure is worthy of it. But now we can open the floor to questions. I'm sure that people have things to ask about. Such figures have always been around. Uh, the rabble rousers and uh, opinionators who um, were anti elitist, uh, couldn't stand intellectuals, uh, thought all liberals were decadent, and, uh, and, and so on. Uh, so I don't think it's a new phenomenon, um, but I would go along with Rush Rindo and hesitate to call him a public intellectual because I don't think he's a man who's interested in ideas as such. Which is at least 
one way to define an intellectual. He's interested in, he in fact, he said, once said, um, in, a, in a very interesting, because he's not stupid, in a very interesting uh, profile written in the New York Times magazine about him. And he said, I'm not in doing, in this, in doing this because to, to promote particular ideas or to promote conservatism. I, I'm in this as a business. And I know that the more people that listen to my uh, radio program, the more money I make. And um, I thought this was an astonishingly honest uh, appraisal of, of what he was doing. And um, uh, there's nothing wrong with that. But he's not an example of a public intellectual. I mean, I would, I would add to that that, um, put it the other way around, I mean, this, that intellectuals need anti-intellectuals, um, that uh, it's part of the pluralism Choose again about which we should argue, analyze, illuminate, um, provide our thinking. But intellectuals cannot um, uh, rest on the label intellectual. They need to win the argument. They need to clarify the argument. They need to bring clarity to moral questions. Uh, and I think it's a healthier society if you have anti-intellectuals against which to argue in certain cases, but at least uh, who are raising the question. As long as they don't try and shut you up, I mean, the, the, the German, I think Goering has always landed with this, but I think it was actually the education minister or something in uh, Nazi Germany who said that every time he heard the word culture, he goes for his gun. Yes. Uh, that's not helpful to intellectuals. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, mean, I think on this question, uh, I, I won't go too long, too long, but um, I connect it back to the discussion that we were listening to before about I kept on thinking, partly because I know both of us have spent time there, about Japan. Um, uh, Ian has, has uh, delved into Japanese culture and Japanese life much more deeply and more sophisticated way than I have. But I think certainly during the 1980s when I lived in Japan and, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, Ian uh, was writing about it as well, there was a constant debate, is Japan a democracy? Um, yes, it has elections. Yes, it has a Yes, it has civil society. And yet, there wasn't quite the same sort of cut and thrust of debate. There weren't really anti-intellectuals and intellectuals freely operating. There weren't um, the media. Was, there was sort of some anti-intellectual, anti-establishment parts of it, that were very pro-establishment. The freedom of the debate was rather narrow, but it is a democracy. Um, it's not a fully plural society. And I think it, it Thinking about it, one makes me glad uh, that we have a, a, a freer intellectual debate um, in uh, Britain and America. But also, it, it adds to one's, my thought that uh, we can't have a single template. Well, the way, thing, the way this should needs to work. It's very interesting that you, you mention that because I think it's very important in, in the context of uh, the role of intellectuals play in different societies. Because in, in Japan and in China, I, I do I agree. I think there is a dearth of public intellectuals in the sense of independent voices who are critical, um, because that is not the traditional role of, of the intellectual in, in China, in the Chinese or Japanese tradition. The, the, the traditional role for a, a, a literati in China or an educated man is more to be a kind of scribe. You're there to um, support uh, the government state uh, and, and articulate its, its philosophy, its ideology, its ideology ideas and so on, although in the Confucian tradition it's also true that well, in China at least, it was um, uh, in theory the role of the, Confu of the, of the scholar official to correct uh, the emperor if he strayed from the path of virtue. In practice, of course, you did this often at the cost of uh, your head locked off, yes. which didn't encourage uh, this kind of behavior. <coughs> and, and so I think there is a, a, indeed a and which is why sometimes uh, outsiders such as yourself make quite a good living um, saying things in Japan that the Japanese themselves don't really want to say. That's right. Poet Byron once said that the English have not the word longer, but they have a thing in considerable. <laughs> 
confusion. I'm terribly sorry. <laughs> <laughs> You're referring to who? To the past. <laughs> but more, I, I'm glad you've chosen to be English for this occasion here. Um, uh, no, and, and I think the same is true of intellectuals. We think we don't have intellectuals, but in fact we have them in considerable profusion. Uh, we think intellectuals begin at Calais. Uh, they're French or they're completely European. We have a lot of them. Um, Stefan Collini, the intellectual historian, has actually written a rather good book about this, which you probably know, called Amps of Minds, um, in which, amongst other things, he argues that the term public intellectual is far from being an oxymoron, it's almost a clear lesson, in the sense that it's what defines an intellectual is someone who comes out into the public sphere, who goes beyond their narrow professional field, but having some professional authority from their particular expertise. I mean, you were enjoyably sarcastic about Neil Ferguson, um, but actually, could Neil, have mentioned other names. one could have mentioned others, but the fact is, Neil has real expertise in financial history, in political economy, and the authority that he has derives to some measure. And we can argue about how he uses that authority, but he does have that expertise. And of course, Isaiah Berlin had that in the States. He had the authority of the intellectual historian and the philosopher, and that was the basis on which he became, in many ways, a model for uh, public intellectual. One of the key features of the role of a public intellectual is the one you both mentioned, independent not just to speak truth to power, simply to speak truth to whoever is prepared to listen, right? Now, our subject is Isaiah Berlin as public intellectual. The charge is quite often made against Isaiah, that he was in some respects too close to power. Uh, to some extent, in the case of the State of Israel, but more specifically, in the case of the Anglo-American political establishment War. There's actually a program running on BBC Radio 4 as the State of Evident, which is making this charge against Isaiah and the Cold War liberals, um, the CIA funded Congress of Cultural Freedom, and so on and so forth. So I wondered if you or anyone else would like to comment specifically on that charge directed at, at Isaiah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, of course, I mean, uh, I would never propose to suggest that um, there's a lack of intellectuals in, in, in Britain or indeed in America. In America, people often think of America as an Anglo-Saxon society. In many ways, it's a profoundly German society, and they, they tend to be rather, there's a tendency towards intellectual earnestness that you actually don't find in England, which is one of the things that I think irritated Isaiah Berlin when he lived there. So, of course, there are many intellectuals. I was simply saying that there was a healthy skepticism, and sometimes unhealthy skepticism, in the climate as well. Um, was he too close to power? Um, I'm not so sure it's fair, because I don't think he held his views um, on totalitarianism specifically, or, and, and communist society specifically, because he felt that this is what his masters wanted to hear. And I think he genuinely believed it. At a time that there was a serious debate on this, I mean, one forgets this, of course, Forties and fifties, it really was. A, a, there were people, serious people on both sides of, of this debate, um, and uh, I think he played an important role in that. But I think it's unfair to say that he did this because somehow he wanted to uh, sidle up to, to, to power. Now that he um, uh, was an intensely social man and uh, quite enjoyed uh, sitting at the high tables of this world is probably also true. I think one person who criticised him for this severely was himself in the Italian immune to these uh, temptations, uh, i.e. Christopher Hitchens. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, again, I, uh, to use that um, as an illustration of, of his corruption, as it were, I think is equally wrong-headed. Well, I, I, I don't think I need to add too much to that, but just to say um, I'm certainly not qualified to judge what he actually I'd be I think that Cold War liberals um, were necessarily going to become too close to power. Um, they were on that side. Um, they were therefore always going to be inclined um, at sometimes to confuse with the, the answer to the question, which side am I on, to with the question, is my side doing the right thing? Um, and I think that's a, a difficult uh, question to be sure about. The Iraq War was another um, great example of that, um, as I'm sure has been discussed already.
presented at high tables. Uh, I think did do it entirely in good faith. Yes, exactly. Yes, hello. My name's John from Lehigh. Uh, as you probably know, uh, Mae West once said that marriage is a fine institution, but she wasn't ready to the institution. And your concern, your uh, emphasis on institutions, gave me a little bit of pause and on, on authority for the public intellectual, uh, especially in this day where, you know, as you mentioned, the blogosphere, uh, Facebook, YouTube are coming very much into the fold. And I live in a country now in Italy where, in fact, this is seen uh, as being a very good thing for democratization as a professor of law at Harvard, Luthai Bengler, who has talked about the Berlusconi effect, which is when you have all media concentrated uh, in a single single fist, and where in fact most of the, uh, the public intellectuals there look more like Mae West than they do like Isaiah Berlin, <laughs> then you've perhaps got a little bit of a, a, a problem with that institution. And that, the, uh, that in fact the democratization of uh, the intellectual sphere of that type of communication is in fact a good thing. And I'm just wondering with, uh, you know, with your defense of the New York Review of Books of The Economist as being authority giving instruments to uh, uh, the New York Times, for that matter, to intellectuals. Aren't public intellectuals ignoring this uh, loss of authority and the loss of institutions at their peril? We like to think that we gave authority to New York Review books in the <laughs> But I think as you know, those things survive only as long as uh, this is really, really for our check. Uh, so, I mean, I, I, I think authority um, is given by readers and viewers and listeners and think and, and audiences, um, basically. Uh, but we, I think people, as readers, as listeners, what I'm saying is that they like agency in the, in the, in the sense that they, that you just see a picture of some bearded man um, with glasses um, and with some funny name why should you believe him? Well, maybe because somebody else has, has, has decided that he's worthy of publishing on the browser um, might, be a, might be a reason. So it was, there is a, it's a weak institutional strength that, that, I, that I'm looking for. I think democratization through the internet is a wonderful thing, um, both in the sense of giving more pluralism and extending the conversation, secondly, with one across borders, but also to a much wider um, part of the community, and third, challenging um, existing um, power holders, of which one hopes it would eventually uh, um, Berlusconi will be challenged by this. Um, I, the only limit I would say to that is that um, for Italy is that um, his crucial uh, control is over the advertising industry uh, in Italy rather than the television industry. The crucial lack of antitrust legislation and then means that he can starve any uh, other, any other, any competitors um, who, who, would, who might come up against him. So that multi-channel television ought to be a, a threat to him. The internet ought to be a threat to him. But if he can control the flow of advertising dollars, he can, he can, he can prevent that ultimately being a threat. There's no lack of voices in Italy. The, the difficulty is getting the voices heard and financing. Brief comment on China and the question on America. I think um, Ian was a little unfair to say that Chinese public intellectuals don't really do very much. There's a big debate in the Chinese newspapers on economics, foreign policy, the nature of democracy. You have a guy from Xi Jinping writing liberal internationalist op ed pieces, and then you have a guy from Yan Suetong writing assertive nationalist pieces, just like as if they were in the pages of Herald Tribune. So I think there's a, within certain clearly defined limits, there is a real debate. China, which is very healthy. My question is really for Timothy. Timothy said he doesn't like public intellectuals um, being too close to power or taking part in government. Well, I wonder, surely one of the strengths of the American system is that you have people like Richard Haas or Bob Zellick, who are very fine thinkers on foreign policy, who do go into government, who then get better at thinking on foreign policy because they're in government, and the government is better because they're in the government. And then they go back to being a think tank afterwards, and then they can speak freely and write wonderful books. So surely as long as they think independently when they're out of government, 
it's okay if they go in every now and then, is it not? Uh, we need a microphone over there. Yeah, but there's this one. Last time I wanted to hijack this, but since you asked the question of me, I would say two things. One, I think the term intellectual, in the sense in which we're using it here, is a description of a role. And that role is necessarily different from, separate from, and in some sense adversarial to those in power and politics. This was my argument with Vassar Harvey. In other words, yes, you can be an intellectual and then a politician. You can't be both at the same time. That's my number one. Uh, uh, point number two, my experience of people who have gone into government and then come out again, present company excluded, <laughs> is that they do tend to lose their critical intellectual age. It's a disease which one might call Kissingeritis or Brzezinskiitis or one I think several other terms. And first of all, they are hopelessly partisan on their own period in power, to which they have a dreadful tendency always to return on every question. Um, but they're also far too understanding of what it's like to be in government. Far too understanding. We should be a little not too understanding of how difficult it is to be in government. And so I actually hold with Emmanuel Kant, who said it better than anyone, who said, as you remember, that the possession of power unavoidably corrupts the free use of reason. Yes, but I see what you mean, but what about the, um, the first power, or rising power, or, or even having it? It, it? If you look at historic figures, several come to mind. Uh, Cicero, Machiavelli, wanted to be, desperate, wanted to be, Confucius, who was basically a political advisor. Um, Burke, who was a professional politician, after all. All these people um, spoke to for power, spoke to power, were deeply involved with political power. You can be, I think, an advocate, and you can uh, be active, a polit an active politician and still be described in one way or another as an intellectual, because I think Burke was. I, I, I think, yeah, surely. The distinction between speaking for power and speaking to power is an absolutely fundamental one. And on the whole, the people you mentioned were distinguished by being unsuccessful honorable politicians, ah. but great political writers. I mean, that's true of Confucius, who of course never did have a really successful position. It's true of Machiavelli, and Burke hardly had a great political career. Roy Jenkins, I mean, I think that there is a kind of political one of the politicians, but actually never make it. So I think the dividing line comes at the point where you engage directly in the competition for or exercise of political power. If you stay outside that line, you remain the critical public intellectual. I think, I think perhaps one answer to it is, uh, I mean, that reconciles Charles and, and, and you, Tim, is that um, I think that uh, government, good government, benefits from having well-qualified, intelligent people take part in it. But as soon as they come out again, we shouldn't believe a word they say. <laughs> um, I, I exaggerate for effect, but we should definitely exercise, as other um, writers and pundits and um, court jesters, we should definitely treat them much more cautiously and at a distance as soon as they come out. Yeah, a couple more questions. And... Sorry. I believe there is no, no time for that. Uh, but there is an area uh, where public uh, intellectuals play an important role, and uh, we didn't uh, touch that so far. I mean, universities. Um, uh, I wonder if you could uh, dwell on that, of, of the impact that uh, I said Berlin uh, sort of uh, had on, on the audience that he faced on a daily basis. On, on his students as being a, as a, as a public figure or a public intellectual. It's, 
difficult to, it would be the presumptuous of me to answer that question since I, I didn't, we all had our different Isaiahs, uh, several of them. I, mean, I think uh, Steve and Luke's talked about how uh, Isaiah Berlin himself created, uh, uh, sort of, when he described the lives of people like Mill and uh, Herod and so on, uh, had one eye on the mirror. Uh, the same is true, I think, of all of us who knew him. Uh, one of the great things about somebody who died and who we, one admired and loved, uh, in Auden's words, the deceased becomes his admirer, is that we all see him through our own lens. Anyway. I didn't know the Oxford Isaiah, I knew a different Isaiah, so it's difficult for, for me to answer. I, I can answer it in the following way. I went to Oxford um, when he was there, um, and I never met him. I never went to a single one of his lectures. And this was probably because um, I thought that um, having a good time was also interesting, but also reading was the, was the key thing. So I think in a way the effect, personally, I think at the time, was that was the, the idea of Isaiah Berlin was important. Um, I was studying politics and philosophy and economics, so he was relevant to me. I should have gone to his lecture. I kicked myself in hindsight that I didn't. But the, I think at the time, what mattered was the idea that he was there and the, and the things that he'd written in his essays, which I read, um, because it was definitely a very relevant part. So he, he, his influence was in the air, rather to me, rather than directly in person. Coming back to the title, I find the expression public intellectual redundant. Uh, for example, in February 2003, the French philosopher Jacques Derrida and the German philosopher Habermas co-signed a letter uh, which was published in several European newspapers uh, entitled February 15, or what binds European together, and they expressed their own uh, position against war in Iraq. Uh, in this case, indeed, we consider these two philosophers uh, intellectuals. But my question is, should we consider intellectuals those um, academics who, in, during the, in, at, the same, at the same time, during seminars of political philosopher, philosophy, discussed arguments for or against just war? Could you explain the advantages of using this uh, word combination, public intellectual, and who, in your opinion, is just an intellectual without being public intellectual? <laughs> I mean, I think, um, first of all, there's a distinction between um, people having credibility in talking about their own subject uh, and having credibility simply as intelligent, analytical thinkers talking about other subjects. Uh, and I think that um, uh, you know, intellectual figures um, need, uh, should be careful in, in as it were, which they do. Are they, are they really claiming to be? to offer their expertise, or, or is it simply that they have a point of view that they, they wish to offer? Um, I think everyone's got a right to put their point of view. Uh, I think we, have, we should have a debate about whether the war is just or not, whether the war is justified or not, um, whether what should be done, when should it be done, and so forth. Um, and everyone has a, a legitimate point of view. If they, through perhaps their reputations, manage to get space in newspapers, um, then that, that gives them some unfair advantage. But I'm not sure that in their specific cases their um, philosophical credentials gave them a special voice on this subject, personally. Um, so I think that that's the, that's the difficulty of, of evaluating what intellectual figures put. But I, I think that the general atmosphere of this discussion is correct, which is that um, intellectual is actually both a much broader term than, than one likes, than, than, than is often thought, and also a more dangerous term. I mean, it, it, this is um, it's a very ancient term of intellectual with a rather narrower one of the, the rare, educated, cultivated person, um, a very tiny elite in society. Now I think people with um, intellectual cultivation and uh, education are very fortunately very broad 
what I want to quickly tell you is the genesis of this novel, because I hadn't ever written what could broadly be called a historical novel before. And what actually, uh, I was commissioned by Bloomsbury to write in a series called Writer in the City, which is distinguished writers, way more distinguished than me. And that's why I really I took the job. I thought, I, you know, what, I can't say no. But it was to write about the city, and I could only think about Oxford. I couldn't write about Cape Town, where I come from, and the other places have already been taken. So I decided to go back to Oxford, and one of the things I was going to write about was Adam von Trott, who I'd heard about, almost everybody was at Oxford had heard about. And it puzzled me enormously that Trott should have fallen out with his great friend, Azar Berlin. And as you probably know, the, the exact cause was a letter to the Manchester Guardian where Trott foolishly when he went back to Germany he said that he'd seen this in 1933, he'd seen no evidence of any anti-Semitism and brown shirts that talk, talked to said that much as they helped the Führer, they said there wouldn't <coughs> harm any Jews. And this is manifest nonsense and Berlin described it as a turning point in his life from being almost willfully pluralist in his views to adamantly uh, uh, refuting Trot. And the strange thing about this background to this novel is that um, that uh, Morris Barrow also was against Trot and showed him out of his rooms in Wadham in 1939, March the 5th, I think it was, when Trot came back to England. Trot, as Berlin said, had a talent for high, high level intrigue. And I think Berlin thought that that was his main motive to get involved as himself as hero in these world events. Uh, but it still puzzled me enormously that. <clears throat> he could have described him uh, to Sheila Solikoff, Franz Solikoff, as no hero, not one of us, and not on our side. Because what we know about von Trott is that he died heroically. Now, what exactly happened between proposing to write a book about Oxford and my memories of Oxford and to try and illuminate the Trott story was that I found a piece of film I read about in a biography of the Trott. There was a bit of film which exists of the trial of the German. Sisters. And indeed, Trot was one of them. I found the film and I saw it at the Imperial War Museum. And what the most astonishing thing was, it was Deutsche Wochenschau was commissioned to make these films. And Trot's, the, Trot is harangued by Roland Feisler, the famous prosecutor. As you know, they were all condemned long before the trial, according to Hitler's instructions, that they'd be hanged like cattle, the resistors. And they all knew they were going to die very quickly. But what struck me most was that Feisler said to Trot, so three years at Oxford was perfect preparation for a traitor, uh, and an English scholarship, and Trot replied, um, well, it was, the scholarship was a Rhodes scholarship, actually, it was awarded in Germany. And it was, Feisler insisted it was an English scholarship, nonetheless, and he said to him, amongst other things, um, so the plan was to surrender, talk to the Allies, and then, basically, after you kill the Führer, and um, that would be it, you would make a deal with you. Know, you know, Trot replied, give this. He seemed to me unnaturally calm. He stood there, and they were all dressed in ugly clothes that they could give all the resistance. Mainly because it was even, it was apparent even to the Nazis that these were the flower of Germany, the whole tribe. These were people like von Moltke, uh, Half of the I-9 regiment in Potsdam, of the Oxford Corps, were in the resistance. Most strangely to me, a uh, huge amount of members of the Foreign Office and the Secret Services. Um, and so what I couldn't understand, and I couldn't see a way of doing this, was how, why, why Berlin never trusted Trot, and why the Manchester Guardian episode was clearly one thing. But there seemed to me to be some deep and fundamental some deep and fundamental uh, rift between them, which I thought could only be explored in a novel, and I will make the case for a novelist of truth, the one which I've had to try and make <coughs> to the Von Trott family, who, as Henry Hardy knows, uh, were not very keen on this book. But it is a novel, and they, in fact, accused me of making Trott a Junker, when in fact it was a Hesse. But as I pointed out, it was a novel. In my own case, 
these two things came together very sharply. One was the fact that in South Africa, before I went to Oxford, I studied, I did politics, and Berlin was a revelation because, in fact, I was faced with the same dilemma that I think people in the 30s were in Britain and elsewhere, which was that while violently opposed to the party regime, my father was editor of the leading anti party newspaper at the time, I was also expected at the university. to join the Trotskyites, okay, and see if you were opposed to the regime, you were supposed to be a Trotskyite or a Leninist or something way more fashionable than a liberal. And so reading Two Concepts of Liberty produced in me a tremendous sense of relief. I mean, it may have been a cop out, it may have been the sense that you could be a liberal with a clear conscience. It certainly cleared my conscience. And when I came to Oxford, I was deeply in love with Oxford from a distance, as many colonials were and probably still are. So what I'm going to do, in fact, I'm going to read a very brief passage in my novel, which is based to some extent on the day that von Trott came back to Oxford to plead the case of giving him a little time and leeway, because he would then, in true Hegelian fashion, have outlived his usefulness, so there would be a, a resolution. And of course, that was anathema to Berlin, the idea that you, you could rely on some ideology or some quasi-scientific theory to resolve problems in history, but you know, it was one of the things that I think drove him mad. The other thing which I haven't heard mentioned today is that I think he also believed that, you, that the life we lead is the life we should lead, and not there is no other life, that we're not living in a false consciousness. And so the title of my book, The Song of the Poor Islam is from his famous quotation uh, of Herzen, that where, where is the song of the poor in the sun? And Berlin replied, exactly, it doesn't exist. It's like a life, I'm paraphrasing, but it's as Berlin did, according to Henry. But it's, um, it's like a life, and it's, singing of it, you can have sex exactly like a life. So my book is, to some extent, a dualism between the man of action, who was Trot, clearly, and the man of ideas, who I think was a self-confessed coward, but only in the sense that, not morally a coward, but in the sense that he didn't really want to go to war or, or be arrested by potential <coughs> uh, Nazi uh, invasion of Britain. So then we read a few pages, and then I'm going to try and explain my thoughts on why they had this rift. 5th of March, 1939, Oxford. Oxford the Enchanted. Axel Count von Gottberg, that is my version, fictional version of von Trump, walks down the cobbles of Magpie Lane. He walks around the familiar and beloved place as though he is trying to feel its topography under his shoes. He passes through the gate onto Christchurch Meadow. Small boys in bright scarlet from Magdalen College School are playing rugby. Tiny figures on the vast green sea. As he gets closer, he sees how white their legs are and how fragile, barely able to carry them into a run. They have curious blue patterns on them, as though their pale white skin is showing the veins beneath. A whistle blows and they stop and gather around the master in charge, who is wearing a cricket sweater and baggy trousers. Across the meadow, meadow where dun cows are grazing or lying down, he can see the river and on it, between the burgeoning Boats are passing, some in leisurely, ratty and long way, others with skulls flashing in the weak sunlight. The English have a special relationship with water. He walks right down to the river and then slowly along past the college barges. Looking back to the colleges, he sees a Renaissance city, spirit and history in local stone. This stone is a pale russet, the colour of the old apple varieties his grandfather had collected at Fresco. Grabenstein and Cox's Pippin. He feels a kind of ache which in reality is for his youth and the girls he has known and the carefree earth, but also a heaviness about what is to come. Even now he, he could choose to stay here and pick up the easy friendships. He could leave his homeland for the life of an emigre, to be treated with politeness and condescension. He loves the landscape because he was happy here. There are few places he has been, and Hamburg is one of them, which he knows to be beautiful, but which have no pull on his heart. Other places quicken the spirit because of what they evoke. They are forever, they forever speak of life as a state of happiness. He can't hope to feel again. Elizabeth said, Plesko, that was the state he had, is the only place in Germany where the madness has not yet struck. And Plesko is the landscape to which his heart is given, and Plesko is in Germany. His family has lived there for 600 years, which is longer than most of these colleges have been standing. His English friends don't understand this deep allegiance. It's spiritual and irrigated. But 
spirit is, after all, only the word that describes what is undeniably human. He walks in a large arc towards the botanical gardens in Audley. The punts are drawn up beside the bank, forming a wooden platform, extending right into the current, like a Roman military bridge. He strides along Addison's Wharf. Fritilleries are not yet out, and the water behind is like ale. He and Elia walked here. Their differences were all in the pleasurable, inconsequential world of philosophy then. And now he remembers Elia in Jerusalem, so happy after his first sexual experience with Rosalind, transfigured. Elia, on the one hand, ancient in his understanding, and on the other, a plump, eager boy in love, a Jewish boy, unmistakably. Now we Germans have created a cordon sanitaire around the word Jew, as if Jew is something like Axelus. Just as he, Axel, cannot use the word Jew any longer without shame, Elia cannot speak of Germany or Germans without contempt. But there is a secret Germany. One lunatic cannot destroy that in a few years. This Germany that Holden and Georgia described as Geheimnis Deutschland is a Germany of the mind. A fable of blood and desire, a fable of fire and radiance. The pageantry of our empress, the roaring of our it is the longing for something noble, which nobody here can understand. He swings back down through the parks where the Narcissa and Daffodils are taking over from the crocuses. When he first came to Oxford eight years ago, he remembers this astonishment that spring, that spring of the thousands of bright undaunted flowers breaking out of the damp, cold soil. Gardening is perhaps the art in which the English have most excelled. It suits their temperament, something to be quietly proud of, and something very private. Every college has a garden. Even now, as the passes through his house, he sees the board of piled in compost, the rhubarb colored stalks of peonies already shining between the pale yellow and white narcissa. On the other side of the road, through the gates that will never open until there is a steward on the throne again. One of those much loved Oxford whimsies, like the fact that the time of Christchurch is always set five minutes later than Greenwich Mean Time. He sees one of the most beautiful borders in Oxford, which extends 100 yards or so. He walks past Blackwood's to Baylor. The porter, Jimmy Tibbs, greets him as if he'd never been away. Good morning, Mr. von Gottberg. Keep him well, sir. He leaves a note for the master confirming that he has arrived safely and has arranged for his bags to be picked up at the station. <coughs> he wonders, though, if Tibbs sees him as an enemy now. He walks back, it is nearly time, past the Easter Island Roman heads, through the courtyard of Bodleian Library, out to Radcliffe Square and beyond. The square grouped around the Radcliffe Camera, the most extravagant building in Oxford contained by St. Mary's Church and Braysmith's College to the west and the south, and the library and also also have two sides, seems to him to be the heart and soul of Oxford. As cyclists come by in a thickening light, he has snatches of laughter and conversation. He looks for girls who might be the girls he knew, as if <coughs> wishing it he could cause them to appear as they were. Yes, we are forever tied to the place where we were young, he enters the lodge and asks for Mr. Mendel. He respected Mr. Mendel's rooms are the great court of Staircase Forza. He emerges facing Ren Sundown on the column to library. He finds the staircase. It is one floor up, his feet ring on the stone. He knocks. Come in, there is Elliot, standing by the fireplace in which a coal fire is burning. He has a book in one hand. Axel, welcome, welcome. Elliot is wearing a three-piece suit, which is bulging the middle slightly. His face, however, has lost something of its boyish roundness. Axel seizes him by the shoulders and kisses him twice. Three years have passed since they were together in the same room. Lovely room, is there. I am here. Um, so I'm now going to read a short paper on Stauffenberg and, <coughs> and the poet Stephen Gilbert, which I think throws a lot of light on, in retrospect, I didn't really realize this at the time I was writing the book, but I think it throws a lot of light on what it was about the German, Germans and the opposition that, that, um, that Isaac Berlin could be trust. In 1958, the German press convention gave a lecture in Berlin on the poet Stefan Georg, 1868 to 1933. He concluded by saying, I think that you will, like me, now see in a new light Georg's dictum, the inmost destiny of a people, is revealed in its poetry. In other words, classic poetry can indeed determine the destiny of a people, and of the Germans in particular. This professor was Alex
Alexander Scheck, Graf von Stauffenberg, and he was the brother of Klaus and Bertolt von Stauffenberg, both of whom were executed after the plot against Hitler's life on July the 20th, 1944. Klaus von Stauffenberg had actually placed the bomb next to Hitler in Wurzler, Hitler's Eastern Command Center, and was shot that same evening after his return to Berlin, believing Hitler to be dead. But perhaps even more extraordinary is the fact that the Nazis, when the Nazis came to power in 1933, they regarded the poet Stefan Georg as one of the artistic and spiritual forebears of their movement. They tried to enlist Georg to their cause, which was to reveal to the German people its true destiny. They proposed the Stefan Georg Prize to rival the Goethe Prize. Georg had died that same year, so it was never clear how close he would have been willing to come to the Nazis. Many of his disciples joined the National Socialist Party. Later, the Nazis cooled in their enthusiasm for him when they discovered that there were a number of Jews in his circle. But the suspicion has lingered that Georg had prepared the ground for Nazism with his appeal to a sacred German who treated it as destiny. Strangely enough, Georg was casually anti Semitic. He once said that one Jew is very useful, but as soon as there are more than two of them, the tone becomes different and they tend to their own business. This is the country club I'm in, by the way. And Jews are the best conductors. They're good at spreading and implementing values to be sure they do not experience life as deeply as we do. They are in general. By the time the Nazis came into power in 1933, some in Georg's circle believed that, it, that this was his moment to move out of the artistic underground. But he was ill and unwilling to reveal himself. But he wrote to Goering in equivocal terms and did not actively distance himself from the Nazis. The Nazis were proposing Stefan Georg a prize, as I've said, to rival the Goethe Prize, which would glorify the qualities they believed they shared with Georg. When, just before he died, he removed himself to a small house in Nuncio, Georg as follows denied that he was absenting himself from Nazi Germany, although after the war his remaining lawyers were quick to suggest that it was indeed a tactical withdrawal. Georg said once that he was not overly concerned by the signs that the Nazis were moving against the Jews in his circle, even when some of his circle lost their academic jobs. But there is no evidence that he would have acquiesced in what was to come. Nonetheless, even in 1933, it was clear that the at the end of 1934, over 2,000 leading intellectuals and artists had left Germany from Western Jewish. It was this uneasy sense that Georg shared some of the Nazi mythology, which le led to modern writers to try to appreciate the undoubted heritage qualities of the master as he's known to himself. Of course, it is also true that in 1933, even some of the people who were to become implacably opponents of Hitler showed a certain sympathy for the idea of the secret or sacred. One of these was Klaus Schenk von Schaufenstein, who drew in colleagues and read to Wales one of Georg's poems in 1907, Antichrist, which is particularly apocalyptic. The Lord of the Flies is expanding his right, and all treasures, all blessings are swelling his might. Down, down with the handful who doubt him. Chair loud as you dupes of the ambush of hell. What's left of life essence you squander at its spell, and only on doomsday. You'll hang out your tongues, but the trough has been drained. You'll panic like cattle whose farm is ablaze, and dreadful the blast of the trumpet. You could, of course, read this entirely differently. But for Stauffenberg, the Nazis were what, what, what Georg had prophesied. Stauffenberg said that the time for tea party conversations was over. He would kill Hitler himself when he was next summer.
time as a restaurant was in fact a step of the day of this cult. The producers of Valkyrie have muffled this into his last words. The story behind Secret Germany does not fit into the script, but they were clearly aware of its significance. Within a few weeks, 80 plotters had been executed for six years in prison by slow strangulation, hung from meat hooks. In all, at least 3,000 were killed, and many children, including Stauffenbergs, were taken from their families and placed in orphanages. Many of these executed People who liked Stauffenberg were appalled by the drift in Germany to take him, both in relation to the Jews and to the disastrous war in Italy. The film is true to most of the facts of the plot, but it fails to convey any sense of the catastrophic moral and political vortex with which the Germans are being drawn. Nor does it give much sense to the immense charisma of Stauffenberg, to whom journalists and politicians defer, who had for some time been Hitler's future chief of staff. And it gives no indication at all of Stauffenberg's background and philosophy. It fitted perfectly. For a start, he looked at all, but tall and classical. <coughs> tall and classical features. He was often compared to a medieval statue of a knight in the Cathedral of Bamberg, his hometown, and his wedding in his, in his cathedral in 1933 to Nina von Lerfenberg, which was a huge social event. Even Hitler believed that Stauffenberg was the embodiment of the German hero, and on July the 20th, 1944, offered his hand to him, something he rarely did. So when the generals failed in their plots, Someone has needed, was needed to head the district with substantial resistance, which extended from the army into the foreign office and secret service, and so forth, the clerics and trade unions. He was persuaded by his uncle, the rough leaders of the school, the long disenchanted the Nazis, that he should lead the movement. It seemed that von Stauffenberg was the man who unmistakably wore the mantle of a near mystic German past. And I think this is the key. A near mystic German past, a noble Germany, a poetic Germany, a Germany of myth. Stauffenberg's stroke of genius was to subvert the emergency plan of the defendant of Berlin against insurrection. Valkyrie's <coughs> plan to counter it with poaching and disloyalty in, in the capital park. The plan, Stauffenberg's plan, said it should be used, mobilized, but to, in effect, put into place a poaching. As Hitler became more paranoid, it seemed that Stauffenberg was the only one who had both the access and the resolve to kill him. He was fully aware that the chances of success were slim, but he felt that he needed demonstrate to the world that there was a better Germany, what he thought of as secret Germany, and perhaps that, was, that he was the agent of history. He puzzled me for some time that the British refused to trust the various overtures and resistance in Germany. Stauffenberg was a close friend and confidant of Adam von Trott, the Baylor Road scholar, as I said. He was also deeply involved in the resistance and executed a few weeks after the July plot, leaving a wife who was still alive and two children. I also pondered the question of why Von Trotz's friend had also just happened in it. As we all know, my nan was a generous man who came to distrust him. And why, as I said, she was able to write in a letter that she had marked up that in, I think, 1976, just a little later, Von Trotz was no hero and not on our side. What he saw, I think, and this is the truth of the country, is that in this mystic German past, and in a belief in an historical destiny, lay also the genesis of Nazis. It was a belief shared to some extent. Hitler may have perverted this belief, he may have turned it into something unimaginably horrible, but the idea of a noble Germany, uncorrupted by racial materials and alien philosophies, a Germany which would be led by one of these world figures, was not invented by Hitler. Long before he came along, the simple word Führer had been turned into something messianic, and I think Berlin knew where the blame lay. During their long work, walks and discussions in Oxford, Berlin often said to von Trapp that when he was at a loss, he turned Hegel's belief that history had a form of forward motion, an inevitable form of forward motion, was obviously an anathema to Berlin. And he used to say to, he used to in fact say to Adam as they walked, which we never got into difficulties in argument in terms of Hegel. Hegel. As, as we all know, for Berlin life was by its nature and birth and unpredictable. It had to be lived day by day. But who exactly was von Stauffenberg? It's ironic that von Stauffenberg's son should have contemptuous of the notion of Tom Cruise playing his part on the grounds that he was a cultist and too short. Because although he was a class joke, the stuff that was undoubtedly tall, he himself was a cultist. He, was, he and his two brothers were themselves members, crucial members, of the group which formed around the mythical secret journey of the master, the first Hitler. The older 
reality is a sinister figure, but in an American newspaper article in the 20s, he was rated one of the most important men in the world. Hardly remember the little red today, the old girl was a poet, and I would have known the sugar in Spain, which I have to say is news to me. Chicago family had held the title of shame from its cup bearer since the 13th century, an honor bestowed on him by the Holy Staff, the legendary monarch of Chicago, who also rules this world. The time of Stauffenberg's birth service of the Wurttemberg monarchy. Stauffenberg's great family speak to tradition, highly cultured, highly regarded, and related to two other great families, York von Wurttemberg and von Gneisen, the family of their daily Prussian children. So it's hardly surprising that Stefan Georga welcomed these good-looking aristocratic brothers into his circle. This main part of being because of the strong homoerotic element in his movement, but also because the Stauffenbergs represented everything Georga felt had been lost in Germany. The medieval greatness, the whole Stauffenberg, warrior qualities that Teutonic knows. Poetry was to lead the way back to greatness, and Georg was Germany's poet. He and his disciples propagated the notion of the unique Germans, which, as you know, is the Deutschtum, which was traced back to Friedrich, a particular favorite of the Georg circle. Members of the Georg circle were subject to some, subject to some bizarre rules, one of which was that they could, were given names by the master. Only Klaus von Stauffenberg kept his own name, presumably because of his flattering historical Residences. His brother Bertolt was told not to marry the woman he loved, and he obeyed, at least until Georg was dead. But even after the war, the surviving brother Alexander eulogized Georg as the spokesman of something unique to Germany. Goering was then revered in the tomb, and after the Nazi takeover of 1933, wanted to be installed. And Georg actually did reply, and he said that for a long time he'd been the leader of German, uh, German poetry, and did indeed. <coughs> the Stauffenberg brothers, after his death, were made Georg's heirs, and this isn't in some metaphorical sense. They were literally his heirs, and they were his papers, <coughs> and they were all what he did in his house in Switzerland and such things, where there were candle readings of his poetry, which sometimes featured the young boy standing proxy for a 15 year old nerd, Maximilian Kronberger, who died in meningitis and was revered by Georg. As the war, Progressed. Stauffenberg enjoyed a rapid rise in the army on the Eastern Front. He was at first enthusiastic about military successes, but he had for some time been deeply alarmed by Hitler. Christoph Lamm had appalled him something, particularly as his brother was married to a woman of Jewish descent. He quickly became aware that the SS and the SD and the Gestapo were creating a lasting legacy of hatred that would one day be avenged. Germany was being dishonored and destroyed by the Nazis. He began to seek out like minded officers and spoke at times quite openly about. Fears for Germany and the army. Sometimes he recited Georg's poem, The Antichrist, to support his army. As the advance east was halted, it became more urgent to end this war with at least something of Germany intact. Stauffenberg was a particular cause for alarm. He was in charge of the logistics of the 10th Panzer Division. He knew that for every thousand casualties after 1941, only 300 replacements could be found. Disaster was inevitable. At the same time, he found himself increasingly appalled by the indiscriminate killing. Russian prisoners, <coughs> and by um, the unbridled lust for murder of the SS battalions, it was having a corrupting effect on the army too. He often ignored or changed orders. He even managed to thwart an order that all Russian prisoners should be tattooed on their buttocks. After Stalingrad, his outspokenness caused some of his sympathetic superiors to decide that he should be sent to North Africa, which was relatively free of the SS. There he was severely wounded, losing part of his right arm. Through sheer determination, he made a dramatic recovery and found himself second in command of the Home Army in Berlin under General Krupp. And he was also appointed to the General Staff, which gave him access to Hitler. After his first visit to the Berghof, he described the atmosphere there as stale, paralyzing, rotten, and degenerate. A few months later, he primed the bomb with the three fingers in his left hand and placed it beside him. The question that the film Valkyrie does not raise is what kind of kind of German Stauffenberg envisaged had the coup succeeded, which in all probability it would have had Hitler been killed. Stefan Gerwig's poem, Secret Germany, was the inspiration for Stauffenberg's oath of mutual intent with the conspirators, which was typed out by his brother Bertolt's secretary. And this is part of it. We want a new order which makes all Germans responsible for the state and guarantees.
guarantees them law and justice. But we despise the lie that all are equal and we submit to rank and daily by nature. We want a people with roots in their native land, close to the powers of nature, finding happiness and contentment in the given environment, and overcoming in freedom and pride the base instincts of envy and jealousy. We want leaders who are in harmony with the divine powers and set an example of others by their noble spirit, discipline, and sacrifice. When Stauffenberg's body was burned and Ring was lost with engraved on it were the words Finis Initium, which is drawn from another of Georg's poems, whose final line is, I am the end and the beginning. This wasn't the journey the Allies or Isaiah Berlin had in mind. Thank you. suggested that he was in with the appeasers, knowing they were So, thank you, Mr. Carter. I think we can open the floor for questions. Would you like to sit here? Yes, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Fanning. First of all, I found your talk very moving, and I also found your book immensely moving. Um, but as I read it, Berlin emerged from me as a diminished figure that uh, his theory and his conversation was in some ways to be contrasted uh, with the action and the boldness of von Schott. And in the end, one has to come away thinking that uh, even if von Schott himself was a somewhat ambiguous figure, morally speaking, uh, Berlin was also left in a very ambiguous position. Was, was that your intention? Hinges the central character in the novel. 
after reading your book, but um, do you, in the book, is there a character of Morris Barra? Beg pardon, sorry. Is there, in your book, is there the character of Morris Barra? Yes, he, there he is, and in fact, the, the, there is a character. Uh, <coughs> this, this evening that I read the beginning with in real life, and as you well know, John Bell and I had Barra through Martin's rooms. I've given that event sort of to both the Barra character appears in the late in the which I read. Right. But I mean, the interesting thing about Barra was that although I think that although Berlin never invented Henry, for God's sake, to stop me if I'm saying this, but if uh, that Barra in his memoirs said that the worst thing he ever did was accuse uh, Adam of being a Nazi, whereas Berlin never relented. That was interesting to me. That I, I just believe that that's the right interpretation. You look at the background of Stauffenberg and the, the strange mixture of the people in the resistance who were in it for a great variety of reasons. Uh, but as I say, Barra was unequivocally ashamed of what he'd said about, uh, about his friend Adam von Schott. Right. I mean, I asked a question because <coughs> Oxford knew about and cared about Stefan Georg. Yeah, exactly. He wrote about it. I know. They both did, I think. I think, I think, I know that Barra did. I, I'm assuming, but I've, I've never read anything, but I'm assuming that he understood more of the background to what was going on in Germany than almost anybody in Oxford. I would think that's true. Yeah. Well, you make me want to read your book even more than before. Thank you. Thank you. Germans were very successful. 